Hello, Internet. This is Adam Brinkerhoff coming to you from Colorado at Space United, and I am here with Troy. Say hello, Troy. Hello, Troy. It is the that time of the week uh, for the Space United Hangout. The uh, topic for this week is how to explore space from home. So I'll switch you over to the slides so we can talk about that. Hit me with the second slide, Troy. Boom. I'm not seeing the second slide. There we go. Okay. So today we are talking about, like we said, exploring space from home, and that might be counterintuitive, but uh, it isn't because there are a lot of ways that you can uh, learn about the stars or the planets um, or lots of other things as well, and we're going to walk through uh, a couple of those, and then we have an awesome guest in about 10 minutes that will talk about the way that he explores uh, space from home as well in uh, a lot of different ways. So um, you may have heard, if you're up on your space news, that the show Cosmos is coming back. So, Troy, tell us a little bit about Cosmos. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I think that uh, a really easy way, probably the easiest way, to uh, get involved uh, in space exploration from your home is to uh, educate yourself and, and to you know go online and, and do research yourself. But one easy way to do that is going to be to just plop yourself on the couch this weekend on uh, Sunday night uh, on the Fox Network, uh, 7 p.m. Mountain Time, uh, the show Cosmos uh, will be airing. And this is, of course, uh, a remake of the original Cosmos um, that was uh, hosted by Carl Sagan. Uh, the new version is, is hosted by uh, our friend Dr. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson and uh, should be a, a super entertaining way to learn about the cosmos. Very cool. All right, next up we have Searching the Galaxy. And Troy, would you click on my link there? Um, Searching the Galaxy is kind of vague, but uh, this is specifically referring to... Uh, joining like an astronomy club or uh, something like that. Um, here, because we're um, Denver-based, we, we typically highlight um, organizations in our area, but um, I'm sure that there are uh, astronomy clubs or, or organizations. Um, uh, this is obviously the Denver Astronomical Society, um, but Really, um, any large populated area or uh, anywhere with a university, you'll probably be able to find uh, some sort of astronomy club. Uh, and the other thing is you don't really have to have a club. You can also uh, just do some research online, uh, pick out a good telescope, and uh, try to find an area um, either in your backyard or nearby that you don't have a lot of uh, light pollution or ambient light, either from your own house or street lights or uh, city lights, wh wherever... Uh, you are, just try to get it out to a rural area so that you can see a lot more, and then um, point your telescope up um, and check out what you what you see, learn about what things are up there. Um, and even if you don't want to invest in a telescope, uh, there are also a lot of really good tablet and uh, smartphone apps that can uh, be used for some, I guess, more amateur uh, astronomy, where you can po just point it up and it's um, uh, calculated with the, uh, what's the word, uh, the accelerometer so that it, it figures out where you're pointing and then what, uh, what stars or planets you're looking at. So uh, check those kind of things out. What about discovering exoplanets, Troy? Yeah, we talked about this one uh, a couple of weeks ago, but um, recently I, I saw in the news actually in Astronomy Magazine uh, last week that um, there's some new Kepler uh, findings and, and Kepler, as many of our listeners know, is a, a space telescope that was launched by NASA in 2009 specifically to look for planets outside of our solar system. And uh, they just recently confirmed uh, 715 new exoplanets, which brings the total to, to over 1,700 confirmed. Um, this work was done by the, the planetary scientists at NASA's Ames Research Center, but anyone with internet access. Um, at home can go online to planethunters.org uh, and this is the, the site that we talked about and you can help in the exoplanet search. Uh, this is part of the, the Zooniverse uh, as, it, as it's known but essentially what you can do is you can come on here and uh, you look for uh, 
uh, or help look for new exoplanets by um, looking at the, the brightness of stars and how that changes over time. And essentially there's just, just a, a real quick short tutorial that, that walks you through how to do it and then they give you data sets that, uh, that you can go through and um, try to help I identify uh, what might be a new exoplanet out there uh, beyond our solar system. So I think this is a, a really cool way for anybody at home to get involved with space exploration and it's something that uh, is, is you know, as, as recent as last week there's, there's new discoveries being made and you can be a part of that. Yeah, and just to add to that too, um, this is, for those of you that aren't familiar with exoplanets or what that means, uh, one of the, uh, well exoplanets in general from what I understand are and our guests can, uh, later can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe exoplanets are just planets outside of our own solar system. Um, but specifically with uh, Kepler uh, and some of these other efforts, they're looking for uh, planets that they think can have or inhabit uh, life. So uh, those of you out there that know a lot about Earth and, and why life is able to um, survive uh, here will probably know that uh, it's due to a lot of very specific conditions on Earth. So it wasn't um, something that can happen a lot of other places, which is why we haven't found any life anywhere else. And it has to do with how far away we are from our star, which is known as the sun. Uh, it also has to do with um, the way that the uh, Earth rotates and, and the different seasons and um, uh, a lot of different things in terms of the positioning and the physics uh, surrounding the Earth. Um, and so one of the things that these studies help is to try to find um, other planets that might have similar conditions so that uh, we can focus our search for life on those areas. Um, and so if that's something that you're interested in, definitely uh, check out that resource. So uh, mm -hmm. last on our list, we have launching an Explore Lab. Um, we always talk a little bit about our work at Space United, and we want to know, or we want you to know, rather, what we're up to. We're really excited about um, the latest development in this uh, project, and that is that we are planning our first in-house uh, launch for 2014. We uh, have participated in some other high-altitude weather balloon launches, which is the um, craft that sends these up to the stratosphere at about 100,000 feet. Um, but we are preparing to uh, do our very own launch, uh, and that involves a balloon and a helium tank and a bunch of other hardware. Uh, including a GoPro camera and a GPS tracker to get some really cool data. Um, but the key for you out there is that you can participate, um, and the way that you participate is by buying an Explorer Lab. Uh, for only $99.95, you get to get this really cool rocket-shaped payload carrier, uh, and then we send that to you empty. You fill it with your science experiment, whatever that may be. Uh, it can be a, something as simple as a seed uh, or a candy to as complicated as a small electronic device, um, and then you ship it back to us. We send it up. Uh, we uh, track all of the data, uh, and then not only do we send your experiment back to you, but we also send you all that data. So it'll be some really cool videos of uh, the blackness of space, as well as uh, photos of the launch uh, preparation and the launch itself. Uh, and then we'll also get data on the trajectory, both um, in terms of where it goes on like a two-dimensional map, as well as where it goes uh, three-dimensionally up into the sky, and you'll be able to see where the balloon pops and where it um, parachutes to and so on and so forth. So it's a really cool way to get either you or your kids maybe involved. Uh, we also have some discounts for uh, bulk um, purchases, so please contact us about that if you're interested. We can also do um, international shipping, but it's a little bit different in terms of the price point. So the $99.95 price includes... Uh, all of the shipping, both uh, there and back, and back again uh, for anyone domestically. So um, please check out that uh, page that Troy has up on the, the screen. Uh, just go to spaceunited.org and look at our missions and click on Explore Lab, and uh, we'd be happy to get you involved in that program. So without further ado, um, Troy's cueing me with the slides that we have our um, guest today. He has many, many jobs over his life, if you look at um, his information online. And I'm going to remind him to unmute himself so we can hear him in a second. Um, he, uh, just off the top of uh, what we were able to find, uh, has worked for NASA and I believe is continuing to work for NASA. He's currently based in South Africa. 
And um, we know him through his involvement at Uingu, uh, which he'll explain in a minute, as a astronomical researcher. Uh, Dr. Henry, Henry Throop, welcome to the program. Welcome. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Uh, we're, we're glad to have you here. So uh, the first question is about uh, Uingu and your involvement there. So can you tell us a little bit about uh, what that organization does and, and what part you have in that organization? Yeah, you bet. Um, so Uingu is a new project that um, uh, several of us have, have, been, have launched uh, recently. Um, we have basically the, the, what we're trying to do here is, 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 uh, is get the public more involved with, with space exploration. We can do that in two ways. And the first is actually be by, uh, by letting the public name things in space. Uh, what, we, what we just launched uh, last week is a new project where we have, you know, here, here's a situation. Let's back up. Let's look at, let's look at Mars. Uh, we, we've, we've known about Mars and, and, uh, and the features on Mars for uh, you know, much of the last century. Um, we know that there's, Mars is covered with craters impact craters from, uh, from you know, basically asteroids and meteors hitting, hitting the surface. Um, and uh, uh, we can see some of these from space. We can see some of these from, from Earth, and, and uh, maybe the largest ones have been named. But Mars has probably hundreds of millions of craters which have never been named. And what we're trying to do here is get the public involved in exploring the surface of Mars, finding the interesting places on Mars, and putting their name on Mars. So we have a new, uh, a new website which allows them to actually uh, use all this fantastic NASA imagery, zoom around the surface, pan around the surface, uh, explore the surface of Mars, explore these named craters, uh, because the, the um, one group, the International Astronomical Union, has named about on the order of 1,000 craters on Mars uh, and other features as well, some of the, uh, some of the uh, they call them chasma and labyrinth uh, zones and um, some of the plains on Mars, some of these other features on Mars. There's real real geological maps of Mars. And so you can, uh, we have this website where you can explore all these existing names of Mars, all the, uh, explore the names that, uh, that other Earthlings have put on there and put your own names on as well. And the point here, uh, so that's, that's sort of the first way of exploring Mars, is actually go, going in there and doing it. And what we're doing with this money is, uh, is starting a, something called the Uingu Fund, which uh, is um, uh, designed to raise money for uh, funding of science programs. Uh, NASA science pro programs have been, have been cut some. Uh, there's a lot of independent science programs that, uh, that are fantastic and, uh, don't, and there's not funding available for them. So what we're trying to do is, is provide an alternate funding source so that, uh, so that we can fund some fantastic science to be done on the Earth uh, through, this, um, through this program. Wow, that's that's awesome. Um, it's it's great to see that you're giving people an opportunity to get involved, but then you also turn around and, and use that to uh, further uh, more research. So I I don't know if this is an actual term, but for the sake of the conversation, I there, I put your next question as why is virtual space exploration important? And really, all I mean by that is um, uh, doing things like um, exploring space on a computer, uh, through software like the one on Uingo's website, uh, or it, even with a, a telescope. Basically, anything that we're doing here at home um, uh, on Earth virtual versus uh, being uh, in space, either as an astronaut um, or um, controlling a, a robotic spacecraft. So you've had many years um, experience as an astronomer and as a scientist. So um, why do you feel like it's important to uh, continue this effort to explore space from home, um, either uh, as an astronomer or, or any other ways that people can do it from home? Well, you know, this term virtual space, uh, virtual space exploration, you know, if you think about it, that's kind of how the vast majority of, of astronomy done by professional astronomers happens today. Um, whether you do it at home or whether you do it at your office or university or wherever it is, uh, that's what most astronomers are doing, is exploring the universe sort of remotely or virtually uh, by using images that are taken by, let's say, Hubble Space Telescope or by NASA spacecraft or by uh, rovers on the surface of Mars, you know, things like this. And then they're analyzing those back, at, back home at Earth. With uh, with the Wingu, you're really doing the same thing. You know, we're 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 using this this uh, NASA imagery and letting people explore it at home. Um, there's been a uh, 
you know, a shift in the professional astronomy field that uh, fewer and fewer people are actually employed at the large NASA research institutions, um, places like the Goddard Space Flight Center and the Jet Propulsion Lab. They're still doing good work there, but there's fewer and fewer people who are who are there. Uh, there's much more in this in the field of uh, of uh, you know, professional astronomy that can be done remotely, virtually, and at home uh, as well now. Great. Um, well, it, it definitely sounds like important stuff, and um, we're excited to see um, how this new development at Uingu um, continues to develop and what names people come up with and, um, and how uh, the fund is able to further the research in the area. Uh, Troy, did you have any... Uh, questions for Dr. Thru before I move on with mine? Yeah, I mean, uh, have, have you gotten a chance to name a crater yourself? <laughs> I did, I did, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've named a couple of craters. Um, there's some, uh, you know, there's some, I, I live here in South Africa, as I mentioned, and there's some uh, rural village schools that I've that I've gone out to visit and do some astronomy with in uh, Limpopo is one of the states around here. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the provinces of South Africa, and man, I was so inspired by the by the uh, by the work that these the, these kids were doing and their teachers um, at some of these village schools, which are I mean they're out in the middle of nowhere. They do not have toilets, they don't have libraries, they don't have a uh, computers there or anything, but yet they do fantastic work there, and the kids are are you know really doing well. And uh, so I named a couple of craters after uh, after those schools and the and the villages that they're in because I thought that uh, they needed some recognition there. Um, and uh, that was that was uh, those are my first craters that I named on Mars myself. So very cool. That's very that. cool. But there's there's hundreds of thousands of more craters left there. Um, Troy, you said you'd name something there yourself. Is that right? Yeah, I had a chance to um, to go on there uh, on the the day of the launch actually, and and uh, found a crater. It's a it's a pretty cool system that you guys have put together, and um, you know just. Uh, looking around on the maps, uh, you know, and zooming in at different areas, um, I, I did get the chance, as you said, to, to name a crater. I named one after my wife, uh, and I found a really good one in, inside of the Gale Crater. So it's it's a smaller crater, um, which which is nice too. Um, some of your program is is it's really um, scalable. The different types of individuals and organizations that can get involved. The craters start, I think, around five dollars and and go on yeah, up right. to uh, provinces and, and districts. You can you know help uh, name an entire area. Uh, one of the cool things that I saw just this morning that the uh, Mars One Group, which is a another um, nonprofit space exploration uh, organization out there, uh, has adopted the Uingu Mars Map as as the map they intend to use when when they are sending explorers out. Out there, uh, did you have a hand in that, or have you? Uh, are there any other, uh, you know, larger organizations that that are throwing their support behind you guys? Yeah, there's there's some other ones uh, upcoming as well. I can't tell you about them right now, but uh, there certainly are. <laughs> We're really excited about the stuff with with Mars One. I mean, they're doing um, they're doing great stuff there. It'll be cool when they're uh, you know going around and um, uh, you know landing on the surface and exploring uh, these craters. Using using the names that that people on Earth have uh, have given them. I mean, in the past, you know, if you look at if you look at uh, the the names of craters that have been given on Mars or on the Moon in particular, it's it's mostly just astronomers who've named craters after their friends, you know, and mm -hmm. and uh, things like that. It's not very. It doesn't really represent the whole population of the Earth. And what's cool about naming things now on on Mars with a Wingu is you can name things after uh, it's kind of silly to name to name things just after other scientists. Uh, really, you can name things after anything in the world, uh, which may be more representative of, of uh, humanity as a whole. Mm -hmm. uh, a village in, in South Africa, for example. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you guys also have um, exoplanet naming on on the Uingu site, and and uh, that's something that. We've talked about um, in, in the past, and, and we Space United's even blogged about um, what we saw as kind of a, an issue there, and that's the the names that get attached to to the exoplanets are are horribly boring and impossible to remember. Um, <laughs> you you and, mean HD two hundred nine four five eight B is not your favorite name? Uh, well, it's it's up there, but maybe not the top one. But uh, you know, that's another part of the program that you guys are doing to help uh, raise funding for science and education, and and uh, we we definitely support you in in that area as well. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, that's um, that's pretty fun too. Uh, we've 
Uh, there's been on the order of um, well, with these new Kepler planets, you know, well over, uh, uh, you know, into the thousands of of uh, of, of planets discovered, um, mm -hmm. largely with Kepler. Although with, I mean, that's been the largest number, but there's been uh, you know many with Keck and and the other uh, with the other surveys as well, and uh, and we know that that's just the tip of the iceberg. I mean. The statistics indicate that the number of planets in the galaxy probably exceeds the number of stars in the galaxy. Mm -hmm. And so that's 100 billion planets to waiting to be named once we discover them, uh, just in our Milky Way. And so there's a, it's, it's a, as far as humanity is concerned, it's, a, it's kind of a limitless supply of, of, uh, of planets out there look, waiting, to be, uh, waiting to be explored, waiting to be, to, uh, to be discovered, waiting to be named. So, mm -hmm. yeah. What's um, the last question that we have on here is um, what's your favorite way to explore space? Oh man, you know I'm really stoked about the uh, about the New Horizons mission. Uh, this is a NASA mission which um, uh, I've been involved with, uh, which is going out to to Pluto, and um, been been it launched back in 2006 from Cape Canaveral, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I became involved with the project a couple of years before the launch, and uh, we're um, you know, Pluto's great because it's, it's always been kind of the underdog, but it's also, you know, really kind of the, 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 the most interesting of the, of the planets out there, kind of because it's, it's the gateway to the outer solar system. Mm -hmm. And we know a lot about the inner solar system now. I mean, we've, studied, we've been to Mars so many times with, with spacecraft. We've, we've, uh, we're, we're, we're starting to learn quite a bit about asteroids. We've, we're, we have something at Mercury right now. We've been to Jupiter a bunch of times, uh, and those are all great. And, uh, but we've never been to the... the uh, uh, the, the real outer solar system, the uh, to, to Pluto, to uh, uh, the uh, the the inner edge of the Kuiper Belt. Um, mm -hmm. These things are just brand new worlds, and uh, New Horizons is going to be there in uh, just slightly over a year, uh, July 14th, 2015. Oh, that's very exciting. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And uh, where do you fall on the debate? Is Pluto a planet or a dwarf planet? Or <laughs> you're saying the dwarf? Are, are dwarf trees trees? <laughs> um, still a tree, right? Um, you know, you know. I think that it's uh, uh, so. So here's the, the situation: is that Pluto certainly has some characteristics of planets and some characteristics of not planets. Mm -hmm. And um, if it was discovered now, it would probably be be called a you know Kuiper Belt object, um, uh, like all the other ones out there. Um, but it wasn't discovered now. It's been called a planet since 1930. And for historical reasons, um, I keep calling it a planet uh, because the the um, uh, I mean the the IAU, the International Astronomical Union, they came up with a definition. Um, uh, I think back in two thousand was it seven um, for uh, for for what the for for what a planet was and what a dwarf planet is and so forth. But their definition is awful. Uh, it, it, it's not very useful if you read it literally. Jupiter is not a planet. None of these exoplanets are planets. Uh, it's debatable whether the Earth is a planet or Saturn is a planet by their definition, um, and so it's fine to come up with a definition of a planet. And um, but their definition is just a lousy definition. So um, so that doesn't do any good. Uh, so I think that having a social, you know, the only reason why we name these things is for 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 humanity's interests, for social sure. and uh, and um, uh, you know psychological reasons really. Um, and so, so having a having a, a historical definition for a planet, I'm not offended by. Hmm. Good. Right, so that's why I keep calling it a Pluto, keeping a planet myself. All right, Adam. Um, well, thanks so much for being on the program, uh, Dr. Throop. We really appreciate it, and uh, your insight and sense of humor are are always appreciated. We'll um, have to have you on again, uh, maybe in a little while, once uh, you and you uh, has a little bit more time to see exactly where things are headed, and, and we're excited to hear about the, the things that you can't tell us about, uh, all of the partnerships and, and uh, involvement with other organizations as well. You bet. Thanks. Thanks. All right. So now is the part of the program uh, that we get to each week where we ask you questions similar to the ones that uh, we ask our guests, um, and uh, we want to see what you think about these topics as well as uh, getting a chance to ask your own questions in a second. So um, similarly to what we talked to with uh, Dr. Throop about, uh, why do you think virtual space exploration is important? So um, whether it's astronomy, um, stuff that you can do on your computer at home, um, going uh, and seeing 
information at museums that have been collected by robotic uh, uh, satellites. Uh, basically, anything outside of going into space yourself as an astronaut, um, why do you think that it's uh, important? A lot of uh, attention is given to manned uh, spaceflight, and while that's very cool and very important in its own way, uh, we, we love robotic uh, flights as well, whether it's imagery or um, telecommunications or all this other science stuff that's being done out in the solar system and beyond. Um, the second question is, what is your favorite way to explore space? So you, at the beginning of uh, the show today, you may not have been aware of the fact that you could explore space or that you were exploring space, but now that you know that you are, um, uh, what do you like? I mean, really just sitting out in your backyard on a starry night and um, or on a clear night where you can see all the stars, it's always a starry night, um, you, you are exploring space, so what, what do you like the best and why? Um, and then we always do our third question as a call to action, so uh, how are you going to explore space this year? Are you going to uh, buy a name on Uingu's site? Are you going to purchase the Explorer Lab on our site or, or do something else? Uh, let us know on the Hangout page um, at our Google Plus um, and um, also tweet us at uh, hashtag Space United. And then finally, we'd like to open up the questions uh, to you. Uh, I'm going to check a couple things to see if we have any questions that have come in uh, during the program. Uh, I think we are caught up. Troy, have you seen anything? I haven't seen anything come in. I am monitoring our uh, Twitter um, page, I guess, as it were. So if you have any uh, questions, you can tweet them out to us. Use the uh, hashtag Space United uh, so that we make sure that we're able to, to see it while we're still on here today. And, of course, you can uh, send in questions throughout the, the week also if there's anything that you'd like to know more about Space United and, and how it is that we're going about improving the world through space exploration. So Troy, um, and if we don't have any questions, we can. We always like to ask each other our questions. So why do you think uh, space exploration is important? Um, well, specifically to, virtual. Sure, two reasons really. Um, one of them, I, I think, it's part of our human nature to want to explore and and to to look beyond the the thing of our understanding to get to know more about our, our universe and and the reasons we're here and and how we got to be and and uh, I think that's a big part of exploring space is is that um, that quest that that I think resides in all of us to to explore our, our world locally and, and beyond. Um, the, the second side of that is the reason why I volunteer uh, my time for, for Space United and, and I think that it's important that we explore uh, space because space gives us a unique perspective of our own world uh, and that unique perspective can, can lead through to breakthroughs that, um, that, are, that are needed specifically in, in areas of, of unmet human needs and uh, if you look at uh, what space exploration has done for us so far, it, there's a, a demonstrated effect of uh, creating new technologies and, and uh, these, these breakthroughs that, that help in, in other areas of our lives. And, and it's things like cordless power tools or cochlear uh, you know, implants or you know, the, there was a, a tool that we used to measure the distance of stars that's now used to... Um, to treat tumors in people, and and it's it's that kind of um, shift in thinking by by putting us in a challenging place that leads us to to new findings, and and that's one of the reasons why I think it's so important for us to explore space. But uh, I'm curious what your thoughts are. Why do you think it's important, Adam? Well, I definitely agree with what you've already said. Um, I think it also uh, gives us a a really cool um, perspective on. Uh, not only humanitarian issues, but also just who we are ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, both in terms of the, the whole Earth and, and what we're doing um, uh, that affects it, um, but also, I mean, more philosophically, uh, I think one of the, the most important photos in that respect in, in the history of mankind uh, was the um, Earthrise or the or as well as the blue marble that people are familiar with, where um, for the first time we got a, a picture of what Earth looked like from um, uh, far, basically uh, the first time that we could see the Earth as an entire planet, and, and it, it's pretty uh, remarkable. Now we kind of take those pictures for granted, um, especially my um, generation being a 20-something, 
um, because we've always thought that they've been there, but that's not the case. And so uh, it, it helps us understand two things, I guess. One is you might feel insignificant because um, you feel like such a small part of a, a big Earth and even even bigger solar system and galaxy and universe. Um, and so I think that's important from a, like a humility standpoint, um, just to, to know that the Earth truly doesn't revolve around you. And, and even though you're important, um, which I'll get to in a second, uh, it's it's easy in our culture to get caught up in the I want everything now and, and it, it's important for me to have exactly what I need and, and everyone else who cares. Um, but then on the flip side, I think it's also a great uh, way to see our impact on the earth um, for good or for bad. Uh, I mean, we constantly have um, satellites that are orbiting the earth. Some are, like I mentioned before, imaging the earth or um, providing tele telecommunications, other are, others are taking other um, scientific measurements that show um, what kind of impact um, we are having on the Earth from a climate perspective, or uh, farming, or pollution, or um, whatever it may be, and, and it helps us understand that um, the, the human race really does have a major effect, especially when you take all 7 billion plus of us um, and combine them, them on this uh, planet, it's, it's really not that big of a planet anymore, and, and our uh, impact is, is quite large. Um, and so it helps us understand what we are doing and what we need to do in the future to, to better, um, uh, I guess, treat our, our world and, and help, help the next generation be able to have a, a more livable, sustainable environment. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're about out of time. Now that I've dropped that uh, philosophical bomb on everyone, for them to go back and ponder. Uh, Troy, do you have any last thoughts, feelings, emotions to share? No, just want to you know thank you for for hosting this each week for us, and and to thank uh, Henry for coming on and talking to us today. Uh, it's always a, a great way to also connect with um, you know our different explorers um, that you know participate in, in Space United and anybody interested in space exploration. Great. Well, um, on behalf of Dr. Henry Throop, our guest, and uh, my co-host Troy, uh, thanks everyone for listening, whether it's uh, live online or uh, through YouTube or Vimeo or iTunes or Stitcher. We're, we're pretty much all over the place, so catch us wherever you can, subscribe, and we'll be back uh, next time. So until then, uh, keep exploring for good. Bye. <laughs>